What's up, everybody? It's Dante, a.k.a. The Forensics Guy, and you are listening to The Forensics Experience, the podcast where we discuss topics in the speech and debate community with the world's most influential coaches, students, and alumni in the activity. Today, I am beyond honored to be sitting with Ian Lampert, who is an amazing coach. Uh, Ian, thank you so much for sitting with us today. If you uh, feel free to just tell the audience, uh, the few people who don't know who you are, let us know what you do in the community. Hi, everybody, and thank you for having me here, Dante. My name is Ian Lampert. I've uh, served as the West Los Angeles NSDA District Chairman since around 2015. And I also work on the boards of the SCJFL, which is a middle school league situated in Los Angeles, and the TCFL, which is the San Fernando Valley and some surrounding areas. That's a high school league. I graduated from Cleveland High School in Reseda, California in 2010, and I've been coaching since. I've worked for public schools, for private schools, a few camps and academies, and I've been director of forensics at Valley International Preparatory High School since 2014. That's a public charter school in the San Fernando Valley. Awesome. Wow. Um, you have such an array of experience, and I'm uh, very glad to have you on, um, especially with the topic that we're talking about today, as some of you uh, uh, probably know just by looking at the title. Um, I thought we'd dive into something that is a little bit... Um, outside of some of the uh, issues that scopes that we've been talking about in some of the previous episodes. And I want to get a little bit more as concrete as possible and kind of talk about how we can create a national champion. Um, the, the entire organization, when you look at speech and debate, you know, a lot of people sometimes just think of maybe like one or two organizations in the head, but honestly there's, an array of different organizations that have to do with speech and debate as a whole. And they all lead up to a variety of different national tournaments, whether it's TLC or NITOC or NSDA or NCFL or uh, all, so many organizations that are doing things for our community. And uh, I think that it's very interesting to look at how we can produce national champions or how we can basically get to nationals and do our absolute best at these different tournaments. And I'd love to uh, kind of pick your brain about it. So um, I'm sure the audience wants to know, you know, um, have you been to any national tournaments? Uh, which ones have you been to? And what is some of your experiences with um, either as a coach or a student uh, participating in that realm? When I was a student, I wasn't aware of many national tournaments. I knew that the NSDA, which was the NFL at the time, had a national championship. And I was lucky enough to watch some of their previous final rounds, which I found really enlightening and inspiring. But I didn't know about the NCFL, and I didn't know about the various other leagues. I didn't know about the Tournament of Champions. And I didn't think that I started really becoming aware of the others until around 2013 when I started paying attention to the NIE TOC, one of the okay. speech tournaments of champions. I didn't attend any aside from the NSDA championship, which I started going to in 2012 until very recently. I mean, the last couple of years. And I found that pretty much all of the tournaments of champions slash national championships do a T are pretty well run. And I think doing a very good job serving a lot of the students who go there and in the ways in which they fall short of serving those students, I think there's a lot of well-meaning people on their various legislative committees that are trying to improve it and listening to the community. Definite. I 100% agree with that. Um, I'm, I, as, as people listening know, you know, I try to talk about a lot of different issues in the community that I can definitely use some, uh, some betterment, basically. But uh, it's very awesome to just see in general the the progress that we have made as an organization um now as this episode comes out in 2020 seeing how much progress i feel like we've made in a lot of years um especially from the early early 1900s with some of these organizations being that old um really it's really awesome to just see so um with with that um i definitely think that you um yeah have a enough experience to talk about this which is great um i think that um i want to look at when it comes to a national champion what what qualities or what are the most important qualities that you think has to do 
being a national champion as a so I, right i think i should preface this by saying that i have not yet coached directly a main event national champion at the nsda in the last couple of years we've coached four national champions in uh, supplemental and consolatory events and then a okay. couple top two top three top four finishes in main events so there are many more qualified individuals than i am to speak to what it's like to raise that however what I can say is I believe firmly in situated learning theory. And that is to say, nobody learns as an island. Everybody learns in the larger context of their surrounding situations. And I think that's why you see success begetting success with regards to team culture. There are anomalies where, where individuals don't come from areas that compete all that often in the national circuit. There are anomalies where individuals who haven't been to a bunch of camps or they're not aware of uh, all the coaching opportunities out there succeed and persevere. And I really tip my hat off to them. However, I think what you find is that certain areas that have a high concentration of previous national champions, especially when those individuals perhaps are part of strong college teams in that community, those tend to produce a whole array of national finalists. And I think a good example of that is the area surrounding the UT Austin college team okay now ut austin is a phenomenally successful team on the collegiate level and i found that a whole lot of their students that is those who go to their camps then go on to succeed at the national level that is not to say that every student who goes to a camp will automatically do better but i think that when somebody is surrounded in a situation where they see exemplars who succeeded in high school and are now succeeding in college and passing on what they've learned those individuals tend to do very well And that's why you see these legacy teams succeed so often, because they've got these great models of success. I'm thinking about Bellarmine, Archbishop Mitty, James Logan in California, for example. The the bevy of fantastic schools in Texas and in Florida. And I think a whole lot of that is what's the surrounding situation and what are the supports that are going to those teams? And conversely, there was an individual who won impromptu at the national championship a few years back. I think it was in 2015. And he was from Idaho. And as I recall, he was the first individual from Idaho ever to win a national championship from the NSDA. That is not to say that students from Idaho are less capable than students from California or Texas or Florida, but it's that they probably have fewer exemplars of excellence. And so the situation of speech culture is less ingrained than it is in, say, a school that's really close to the UT Austin team. Does that make sense? Yes, that totally makes sense. And that's uh, very similar to kind of what I've always thought about is – um, I know there are a lot of different factors in how the those excellent students are produced, like, at first, I guess. But I've always kind of noticed that, you know, I feel like excellence begots excellence, basically. And when, you know, when we're comparing different, like, regions and leagues, you know, talking to a lot of students, uh, students who do know how speech and debate works, you always hear, you know, well, man, I'm just glad not to be in the, you know, the areas like California or Texas where it is, you know, more difficult, I feel, um, to to get to that national level. You know, those um, qualifying tournaments, it's so tough because a lot of the students are like, man, I'm competing against the kid who, you know, they made it to state four years in a row or they uh, were second at NSDAs and all of this. And it does become... Um, I can understand like how you would feel like, oh, this is difficult and things of that nature. But I think I think what you said really shined a light on the fact that um, it's it's somewhat of a privilege to be in that in that area to where um, you as a student, you get the opportunity to just be around so many other coaches and students that have uh, produced a significant success on a national level and seeing how they operate on a daily or weekly basis actually is some type of uh, inspiration and almost roadmap for you to hopefully be able to achieve that same success in the future. Um, So that, yeah, I think that that is uh, really interesting in my opinion. I really, I really like that. Um, I want to kind of talk a little bit about, um, trends, I feel like, of a national champion. And uh, um, I, I'm, I'm interested in how you would feel about this because I think that 
Um, there's some some categories that I've really been looking at recently that have these nuances that honestly, like basically, we can be honest, will almost never change. But I'm but I but I want that, but I want it to change, and I think that that's why I'm bringing this up. Is that like you know, um, I think OO is a really great example to me. I think that uh, the trends like to be successful in OO have always looked the same for me, at least based on my, at least based on my vision. It's that, you know, it's the same, the same like couple steps, you know, the same walk during the transition, the same, like every like little thing seems so robotic, um, even, even at the national level. And, and that doesn't mean that none of the, that those students aren't doing well because they're doing absolutely amazing at what they do. But I, I'm very interested in like understanding if you think that that would change because I feel like I've seen some students who do well, but they don't do the, um, you know, the, basically the stat quo movements and general speech, but, but those students don't end up getting as far because at some point they're going to be seen by the judges who only comparatively have the one way to look at it, which sometimes might mean that they're new, but what could potentially be better way isn't viewed in the same regard because it's not um, the same as the normal. Right. So I think that there's two ways to approach it. The first is incremental and the second is radical on the incremental way. There are a couple exemplars that made it to NSDA finals doing non-traditional things in oratory across the last 10 or so years. One of the ones that stands out to me is, I forget it, I think his name was Andrew Braden, but I'm not positive about that. He got second place at NSDA Nationals in 2011 or 12, doing a speech that was basically about the generational divide between individuals born before and after 9-11. And that is not a typical OO insofar as it's not a completely universal topic. There was no real dramatic climax to it. It was very informative and thought-provoking, kind of like a podcast. And and the final round judges appreciated him a lot, but he was last place going into finals, so he got second overall. I think a second instance of incremental innovation is what the Apple Valley team has been doing for a long time. Instead of doing three big areas of analysis or doing uh, two sub points underneath those three big areas, you know, two causes, two effects, two solutions. Yeah. Uh, instead they do two problem areas, implications, a heart or hope story, and then a solution slash conclusion. And it seems kind of similar as I describe it, but the time allocation of the speeches, the way the walking happens and the general flow feels different. I think if, individuals experiment with those that is they're coloring a little bit outside the lines and they know they could have done well with the traditional speech but they're willing to push the envelope then they might see some copycats and you can spread incremental innovation that way i think that's a good point if you want to see radical innovation that has to come from the leading programs because if you start hearing about an alternative structure that won or maybe got top three at major national tournaments, then that can spread like wildfire and then it can inspire others to also innovate. Here's something interesting that we found last year. I thought, what would happen if we switch to doing the Apple Valley style in our oratories on the local level and at some other tournaments, right? And what we found is that locally, the two-prong approach, their two-problem area implication solution, that went really well. And I think the reason it went really well is it was still structured. It, you can still follow it. However, yeah. a lot of other teams have been adopting the cause effect solution style. So we stood out a bit. However, when we then went to West Coast Invitationals, our success with that style was really inconsistent because a lot of judges, especially those who went on college teams, strongly preferred a three main area, two sub points for each structure because that's how they were taught and that's what they're used to. And maybe that's how they competed. So so I think that if you saw, let's take, for example, the Bradley camp or the Stanford camp or any of these large national camps deciding this year we're going to send out a bunch of oratories that are not playing quite the same way 
and hopefully it'll inspire others, then you might see a more radical shift. Because I think that there's kind of a domino theory with how speech and debate trends are copied. And I think that ultimately, most teams will emulate the things that they see make it to national finals. That is, wow, yeah, that is a really great point. Um, and yeah, I I definitely agree with that. Um, love your insight there. Um, I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna stop really quick just to say to the audience, I hope you're really enjoying the episode so far. Um, but we're going to take a quick break just to hear a word from our sponsors. Um, if you want to join in the conversation, comment down below or DM me on Instagram at the forensics guy and stay tuned. We'll be right back. All right. Welcome back everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed the, uh, sponsor reading, which was probably just me, um, yeah, promoting myself. Um, so I uh, definitely hope to get some sponsors soon. But um, we left actually with uh, Ian talking about um, some interesting, interesting things and how to change kind of the scope of oratory um, and looking at like incremental and like radical changes. I thought that was really interesting. And I think that um, those can really be applied to a lot of different uh, categories um, and every, every type of league is so different. Um, and it's really about like trying to get it to spread in that way. Um, and I think an interesting comparison for me um, that I can look at is uh, the category of poetry. Um, and a lot of, a lot of people don't talk about poetry a lot just because um, it's a uh, it's supplemental. It's a supplemental category at NSDAs, and it doesn't really pop up anywhere else for the most part, unless you're doing uh, local stuff. And um, a, a small difference from Wisconsin, because I I'm from Wisconsin, and uh, the way we did poetry is both poetry and prose were completely separate categories, and um, you could do some original stuff, um, but for the a lot of people typically just chose to have something that was, you know, kind of cut by another person, stuff like that, um, and they just presented it almost not too differently than the way you would present a DI, except it was just uh, presented with some type of uh, binder or manuscript there, and um, I know that that is very different from um, the category in California, uh, with at least with Chassa, uh, that's the only one that I have the most knowledge in. Um, Chassa, it's uh, called OPP, and it's completely original. You have to uh, write your own like prose or poetry, and it's in the same category, uh, and it's uh, very, very different. Um, and uh, it kind of brings me to this question uh, that I have for you, Ian, is that um, basically, do you think that as a whole, like, uh, activity at, for speech and debate, like, do we all need to get on the same gear and not have so many differences between leagues? Would that help every student, like, potentially do better? Or do you think that, you know, these slight differences are good in some way or what, um, what, positives and negatives do you see between that should should all of them just basically be the same should everyone who just be following just the nsda or just the cfl or whatever categories or or is it okay to be a little different out, outside the box sometimes here's what i think because i think that's a great question i think that when there's something that is an nsda main event in particular the events that have been there for a real long time right the dramatic interps and the original oratories I yeah. think that leagues should be on the same page and follow the NSDA's guidelines. I think the NSDA does a good job having a lot of instructional aids that will make it easier for students to adapt their performances to the dominant rubrics. However, okay. I encourage states and leagues within states to experiment with the non-main events and also to make their own events. So our league has a really good entry-level novice event called Spontaneous Argumentation or SPAR. And SPAR is distinct from extemp debate which is what you see at the NSDA Nationals. Extemp debate yeah. is really sort of one-person parliamentary. However, SPAR is silly little topics. The students have a minute to prepare, a minute to give an app, a minute to give an egg, and then a couple minutes to cross X, then a minute to conclude. And they're all in the same room, and it's ranked like a speech event. First place, there are ever many are in the room. And that is 
a really good entry level event, speech and debate should focus on growing. The fact that you see a- activities that are really just memorization based, for example, the spelling bee versus speech and debate, which demands memorization, but so much more, so many layers of critical thinking and camaraderie. It's, it's a beautiful event and activity. And speech should be inclusive as possible in reaching out to distinct communities across the nation. So to summarize, yeah, I think the main event should be on the same page, but I encourage leagues and states to work as laboratories of innovation when thinking about new events that can help spread the activity. I really like that. Um, and uh, um, for for just as a little bit of insight, actually, um, into uh, next week's episode, because this comes out on the 5th. So on um, the next episode, you'll be hearing about uh, mental health um, crises in speech and debate. Um, I'm really interested to uh, kind of look at um, some of those different categories, and I'd love to. I'd love to ha- talk with more coaches and figure out what each different state has um, that's so unique. So I definitely want to try to branch out and reach to more coaches. But uh, one thing that I really think is really awesome um, is a category called radio. Um, I don't know how many other states it's in, but I know in Wisconsin we have a category. It's called radio, and basically it's like a five minute uh, reading, and you read you read it as if you are um, doing like a radio show. Um, It kind of is very similar to um, Extemp, uh, where you would get 30 minutes to prepare your speech, um, except um, they give you like a stack of papers that are all relevant news, uh, stuff like world news and national news and stuff like that. And you cut it down to make a five minute presentation, including like a silly commercial and stuff like that. It's really cool. Um, and probably one of my favorite things is actually that it's judged. Uh, it's one, it's the only category I've ever seen where you don't judge off of the physicality of the person. You only judge off of their voice. Um, and in the past, I remember some people talking about it was actually commonplace, I guess, for judges to turn their chair around and the student would just, you know, they would pretend that they were basically listening on the radio, which is so cool to me. Um, and I wish I got to participate in it. Um, the closest I did was actually um, a different category that we had in middle school called news reporting. Very similar, but a little bit different. Um, and uh, it it's such a cool category because um, I feel like, I don't know if the per- if people were thinking about this, but um, when we were when we're looking at like mental health and speech and debate, um, and like getting more students to be comfortable in the scope of competing in speech and debate as a whole, I think radio is such an amazing category because it opens up the activity to people who like don't even you know they're they're too afraid to public speak, and it's a great start. Like if if everybody actually did the whole turn around the chair thing and the kid just reads it's a great way to open them up into competing and doing it even more and it's really awesome um and i love i love the category it's so amazing so i definitely agree with you um when you were talking about how each um league should definitely be encouraged to add those type of categories because it's it's a fun way to kind of play around and a fun way to get more students to uh, do speech and debate as a whole and they're not you know maybe as intimidated by some of those bigger categories and they can do some fun stuff like spar and radio and it's a great uh, opening to getting even more students to participate in this activity Um, yeah it's so so great Um, and I my last question is actually um, I want to go off of uh, the students a little bit and talk about the coaches Um, I think I don't I don't know um, what your advice would be uh, for coaches who are uh, trying to be in this activity, but they have no experience. Um, Like so just imagine a coach is just like, hey, you know, I listen to, uh, you know, Dante's awesome podcast and I'm interested in doing speech and debate and um, they are trying to figure out what they should do and how they could be like some of these great coaches and hopefully at least make at at, at his very least make some national appearances of their own. What advice would you have to those coaches and uh, how can you um, inspire them to um, hopefully build amazing programs and do their best as a coach? 
I think those coaches should begin by realizing whatever the bar for competitive success is in their local area. A lot of coaches and students can get intimidated because they look at national final round videos and think that's what all speech and debate competitions are like. I've had many students who watch a national final round and then believe that every round is going to be in a big auditorium. So these coaches <laughs> might want to go and scout out some local competitions, talk to local district chairs or league presidents and say, hey, when's your next tournament? Do you mind if I watch? I can volunteer to judge and then learn that way about what the dominant local norms are. After that, I think they can speak with more authority and clarity to their students about what will truly be expected in order for people to find at least competitive success, to say nothing of socio-emotional success, at local tournaments. You have to, you know, you have to walk before you can run. And I think that it's important True. to take that step of anchoring yourself in locally before you set the stage for these large national level ambitions. I also think that coaches should never attach their feelings of success or failure to whether or not they're able to achieve that national success in particular, because it is so out of their control. It is their students so competing true. and it is a totally subjective activity where you can have certain expectations and some trends can win, but nothing is ever guaranteed. It is not numeric. It is not objective. And the more coaches attach their own feeling of success or self-worth to this thing that is at least two layers out of their control, the less healthy it is for them and the less healthy it is for their students, which should be the whole point of the activity. Yes. I am so glad that you said that as at the end, um, because that's actually what I kind of wanted to say too, is um, I I definitely want to use this space to um, encourage people to do speech and debate and coach it, and hopefully offer some type of resources to help people be the absolute best that they can be in whatever realm they see that as. But um, definitely a word to coaches and students: do not be too wrapped up in this activity um it's an amazing activity and it's great for getting better at public speaking and being a better uh presenter as a whole but winning a national championship it like don't get too caught up in that because technically yes it is it's not guaranteed there are some trends that might uh play into it but it's not something that's just going to happen as soon as you do this specific thing, um, it's still very subjective. It's literally the most subjective uh, of anything, probably in terms of competitiveness. And uh, somehow you have to make that work. Um, I try to remind every student that I've uh, ever worked with, I say, you know, in, in 50 years, those gold plated trophies on your, sh you know, on your shelf they're going to they're not going to mean anything in terms of the wins i think they're going to mean so much more when it comes to the memories you know the fun times you had on the school bus driving to the tournament the crazy things that happened in the berkeley you know hotel and it was crazy and stuff and all of this um just you know opportunities where you have fun and when you connected with people and made this activity the best that it could ever be um just through friendship and love um so i'm yeah very glad you said that and want to push that reminder and uh, I do hope that this helps in terms of people who do really want to try to better themselves and build um, a national champion if possible but uh, don't take it so seriously um, so I want to uh, kind of come to a close uh, thank you once again uh, to Ian Lampert for coming on and, sh and giving us his experience it's been amazing to have you on today um, and for those that are listening, as usual, do not forget to give this a five star ranking on iTunes. We're trying to get to the top podcast. Uh, feel free to rank this on uh, Spotify and Stitcher and all of the other places that you can get podcasts at. And if you see me in the streets, say what's up. Uh, same thing with Ian. If you see him in the streets, say hi. Um, tell him you heard. Tell him you heard of him by listening to this podcast. Um, Thank you again, Ian. It was a really honor to have you, and I'm glad you were able to give so much insight to our students. Um, and, yeah, I will see you all later, and you all have a wonderful day. Peace <laughs> out.